Uh, and thank you, Teresa, and thank you so much for everything that the association is doing to promote sort of the messaging, to sort of promote the, the reports, and, and so that everybody in our industry is getting an idea of what's happening. I think for the most part, there's been a general jury out on the whole Asia initiative. Um, you know, it does take a degree of vision to look forward and to see what's happening. Uh, you know, from a, you know, one of the things that, that Craig and I were talking about before we got here is our own individual personal sort of experiences with the Asia market. So we figured this might be a good place to start and to, to have a dialogue and then obviously open it up for conversation and questions. Because at the end of the day, it is, there's top line MOUs and signatures and agreements made, et cetera, et cetera. But it does come down to the relationships. It does come down to the people involved, right? Um, and more so, and very specifically so, in Asian markets. So each one of us, and I know there's a lot of people in the room also that have been working on developing those <coughs> relationships. But I think it's a, it's a great point of departure on this conversation because that's sort of how the conversation begins in Asia is relationships and trust and history. So, you know, I'm actually from Australia. I was born in New Guinea in the South Pacific. And um, when I moved to Australia, I experienced and I lived the influence of the Asian buyer coming into Australia. Saw it, lived it, experienced it. Then I left and I moved to California. And I lived in San Francisco uh, for about eight years. And I saw that impact of the Asian buyers coming over to California as well. So after that, um, I actually moved to Venezuela, to South America. And I was down there. And even in Venezuela, I never forget, going to a, in a Chinese restaurant and in Venezuela and a Chinese person speaking Spanish to me. So I saw the growth, even in the last decade, I've seen the growth of um, Chinese investment into Latin America. So I guess, you know, somebody said to me the other day, Jesse, the Chinese are following you around the world. So now that I'm here in Miami, um, I'm starting to see that same impact happen here. So as I'm watching that, we've been watching the capital markets over the last couple of years uh, out, of, out of China. And I think, you know, some of you may be aware, uh, the Asia Society just did a tremendous report, which was, is called uh, Breaking Ground. Um, I would suggest you look at that report. It's very compelling. And it shows that over the last 10 years, there's been over 350, 330, I think, billion dollars have come into the US. Um, 93 billion of that has been direct investment. And the other 220 billion has been uh, just through uh, mortgage-backed securities. So when people say China owns America, China really does own America. <laughs> and it's something we have to be acutely aware of. And that's happened in such a short period of time. So, when we started watching those numbers, particularly in the last four years, the capital flow out of China into the US, that's when we at Severa said, listen, now it's time to move. Because there's a lot of people who have been working on that initiative, a lot of trips back and forth, a lot of hope uh, that that would eventually get to South Florida. We held back, held back, played the Chinese waiting game, the patience game. It's an extremely patient market. And it was only about three years ago that we decided to make that shift and that transition. So that's sort of how we started on this journey. So I'll turn it over to Craig to speak a little how he started. And it's quite an intro. It's kind of hard to follow Jesse Otley, you know. I've known him for over 10 years. <clears throat> Good looking guy from Australia who moved to Venezuela. So he learned to speak perfect Espanol with an Australian accent. And now he's working on Mandarin. So he's got me <laughs> beat by a lot. But I'll do my best. I think his company, Severa, and my company, ISG, I think it's safe to say, at, at the risk of sounding a little arrogant, that we've probably made more strides in terms of trying to approach the China, Asia, Pacific Rim markets from Miami than any other sales company here. And we were both discussing our experiences before we, we got here today. We got, got on the dais. It is, it, he said it right. It's all about two things, developing relationships um, and patience, because within the patience, we're learning a whole new culture. We developers here, we sales organization that work for developers in Miami, I told you Jesse speaks perfect Espanol, my wife is from Brazil. I, I have learned, I've had the tremendous sensitivity to, to the Brazil thing and to even all of South America. We have offices in Caracas, we have an office in Bogota, office in Sao Paulo. So I understand the South American, the difference between the U.S. culture 
and the South American culture as much as any American could, I think, because it's still different. But when it comes to China, and this is Miami, we're talking about the other side of the world, and what I've learned is that it, they have different set of rules, um, different set of mores, different customs in the way they do business. And uh, what, what I know Jesse's experienced this too. There are lots of people all over the world that are getting on planes, particularly in Miami, and they're flying to Shanghai, and they're flying to Beijing. My, my partner was there last year a couple of times. But can I tell you something? If it takes, if it takes you know, a single step to start a journey of 1,000 miles, that's a single step, because this is going to take a lot of patience. And understand as well, we just talked about South America and China. I, I kind of put my money where our, our mouth is. We have about 20, 25 Asian and Mandarin-speaking salespeople that we've recruited in ISG in the last 12 months, maybe 18 months. Yeah, we made quite an effort in this regard. And even from those young agents, a lot of them are grads from the University of Miami. I'm learning so much about, about how that country rolls and how they see the United States. Miami has become a fascinating option for the Chinese. Fascinating. I personally believe this is my personal opinion. What started it is I'm from New Jersey. I sold Chinese, and my first job out of college was in New York City, working for real estate developers. This is back in the late 70s and early 80s. <laughs> and I sold a lot of Chinese families, a lot of people all over Asia, Koreans, Japanese. Um, they absolutely love real estate. It's no surprise to me that one of the largest percentage of foreign investments, investors in the United States, are from China. Do you still have those people in your database? I wish I did. Unfortunately, it was the, it was the early 80s, and I, <laughs> let's say they're retired <laughs> a long time ago. From there, by the way, I moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey in the early 80s. Um, because there were only two gambling locations in, in the entire United States at the time. You could only gamble in Las Vegas or Atlantic City. We didn't have these, all these other hundreds and hundreds of gambling operations that interrupted, huh? Okay. I'm going to take over and ask them okay. some questions. They're just having too much fun chatting up here, so. All I was going to say is I sold a bunch of Chinese in Atlantic City, too, which proved to me two things. They love to gamble, but they love real estate. So now Teresa will ask us some questions is, what's the thing about Miami, I guess? No. No. I always guess wrong. What does the audience need to know about working with Chinese buyers and investors? One of the things that happened before you came is we got our new NAR International Market Report that they've done for Miami. And for our South Florida market, the Chinese are now in the top tier of investors for the mm -hmm. first time ever. And they are number nine of all investors around the world for Miami. So this is becoming a reality. They are here, they are in the top 10. So what does everybody need to know on how best to work with them? Listen, I, I think that um, the good news is they are here, and I refer to this stage now after three years of working to cultivate these relationships. This to me is sort of the end of the beginning, right? Um, I think the jury has been out for a long time. Are they coming? Are they coming? They're here, they're actively buying. The first wave of, of investors into Florida, for the most part, have been the, the large funds investing in, in land acquisitions. You know, the stronger markets for the Chinese buyers have been Orlando. Uh, there have been Tampa markets, but the first thing to understand about the individual buyer uh, from a, with Chinese buyers, they're looking for a yield-driven product. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I just got back from nine days in, in Shanghai and Beijing, and I came back with three contracts on one of my jobs, and it was all yield-based. So if you're going with a, you know, 3,000 square foot spectacular condo in the sky, it's not really what they're looking for just yet. But I also think we have to understand that real estate is a very relevant business, right? The reason why that there's you know, such a strong South American influence here in Miami, because it's very relevant. You know, you came up, they went to school here, they got married here, had kids here, the grandparents came to visit, et cetera. So real estate becomes very relevant. It's not relevant to the Chinese yet. The point of connection for the Chinese at this point is education. And once the University of Miami had reached that point where it got into the top 50 schools in the US, that's when we saw a spike in, in sign-ups, and it's the fastest growing demographic in the university right now, University mm -hmm. of Miami. 
So education now is a connector. But for the first buyers, if you're going to China, if you're going to travel and talk to them, go with a yield-based product. 43% of the Chinese investment here has been in office buildings. 33% has been in hotels. And the rest is broken down into the other segments. So I think that is very important to understand that, that the buyers now, they're either looking to land bank, uh, accumulate land, or they're looking for a yield-based product. I have exactly the same experience. Our, our company was hired by the related group to sell the condos at the W on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. My biggest market has been Brazil. My second biggest market has been China. Jesse's right. I've tried to sell the Chinese that have been here this year some of my high-end stuff, like projects like Echo Brickle, projects like Echo Aventura. Um, no, they're not end users yet. He's, Jesse's right. Yield-based, cap-based, ROI-based, same stuff. If you're going to approach the Chinese market, understand that Miami is a new city. It's a new idea for the Chinese. They're used to New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco. Heck, all those cities have Chinatowns. They're very well entrenched with the Chinese culture. We are very much in the embryonic stage. So once again, Jesse's right. The early settlers, if you will, from China that have discovered Miami, they're all investors. They're not end users yet. They're not looking to move their families here. They're looking to maybe move their kids to the University of Miami. Very strong point. And they are asking a lot of questions about universities. And it's wonderful, by the way, that the University of Miami passed the University of Florida this year as, one of the, as the most prestigious university now in the state of Florida. You, 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 if you're a Gator, you're number two. But if you're a Hurricane, you're number one. And it means a lot for Jesse and I while we're promoting the Chinese business, because they need to know that the quality of education here is profound. They're not sun worshipers, a bit ironic. Maybe you've heard that. They're not crazy about the sun. They'll walk around on a sunny day here with an umbrella. That's not the tip what fits Brazil. That's all. It's mostly about the beaches and the weather. For the Chinese, it's a little bit different. So in the short run, if you're going to approach it, go with an investor attitude and sell Miami then with a five-year plan, with a 10-year plan, because that's, those are the hot buttons that investors want to hear. So that may be the big money, <coughs> bigger money that's coming in here, but um, let's talk about two other options. So that what I've heard from one of the brokerages that represents developers is that uh, was an anecdotal um, situation that, that he was addressing at a real estate press organization national meeting. And um, someone came in, and his person in the sales center was having a difficult time communicating with them. And so she handed him the list of the available um, condos that were still available in there. And he asked for a marker. And so he marked four of the properties. She was getting pretty excited because it was a very nice building. And she was thinking she was going to sell him four units. And he said, I, I'll take everything but those four. I don't like the numbers. Ah. And so that's one of the stories. And then another one is one of our large companies said that the Chinese buyers who come in are buying three and four units you know, in the same building. Mm -hmm. So it's for one student or two students, for them, for grandparents, for whatever. And so that also is, is happening in addition to the ones that just want cap rates and the big investors. And then we don't want to sell FIU short because they are the only university that has a full campus in China. And they have a larger Chinese enrollment than University of Miami does. And so it's all of these things that are bringing the Chinese parents and family here following their children uh, with our universities and our education systems. So that is extremely important. Teresa, let me just pick up also um, where Craig left off as far as selling Miami. Because to Teresa's point, you know, we're here to gain insight and information about sort of the, the heavy lifting that we've been doing for a number of years, right? Um, as I started to go to China, we started talking about the Why Miami story. And, you know, sure, I go to, my, to China to sell buildings and our projects or land, what have you. But I found that our conversation always begins with Why Miami and Why Miami now. Mm -hmm. So it was, and it's kind of interesting. As sort of the, the economies and our feeder markets have shifted this recent year, that piece of literature that I've created, which is Why Miami, Why Miami now, is being used now. I've done it in Portuguese. I've done it in Spanish. I'm doing it in other languages, in Turkish. 
uh, because it's so compelling. And I think us in the industry, our responsibility when we're out there, we always start with Miami. All the economic drivers that are driving Miami, uh, the infrastructure that's in place now, you know, we have a saying that when we travel, have you been to Miami? Yeah, I was there three years ago. We say, if you haven't been to Miami in the last year, you haven't been to Miami. It's changing that much. So I think one of the tools that you can use when you go to uh, Asia and you're selling Miami is from an economic perspective because the traditional markets, the more relevant markets that the Chinese buyers are looking at, which is LA, San Francisco, Seattle is a very hot market now, Dallas is taking off. Mm -hmm. um, those, New York obviously, those traditional markets are now have nearly priced themselves out and they get a significant slowdown. So the investor, as Craig was saying, is now looking for the opportunity. So if you have a price point that is 30 cents on the dollar to New York, and you have all this infrastructure that's been built in the last you know, 10 years to make this a very much a global city, then suddenly the rate of return, the yield basis looks very interesting at whatever you're buying, whether it's land. I was telling Craig, when I was in Shanghai recently, I went from Shanghai to Beijing on the bullet train at 300 miles an hour. Every hour, I came upon a city that had, must have like you know, 2,000 buildings on it. Every hour. So as I flew back into Miami and I saw this brick on this downtown, I thought, wow, no, no, it's no wonder there's so much opportunity here. So I would lead with Miami. I would lead, I would understand the education that Teresa's speaking about. I would understand the economic drivers that make up uh, Miami, the tourism, how that's booming as a city, the expansion of Port Miami. The second largest financial center south of New York is Miami, which people don't realize. I think it's Chicago or New York. No, it's Miami. There's more banks per block here in Miami. And you know what's interesting to the, to the Asian buyer now is that Miami is a gateway to Latin America. As we're sitting here trying to get Asian buyers, the Asian buyers are sitting there saying, how do I get into Latin America? How do I own a piece of America where I believe in the political system, even though we're going through what we're going through? I believe in the legal system, and I can operate a business here. And, and Florida as a state has created all of this platform that's very conducive to, to business, suddenly is a tremendous springboard to Latin America where there's a lot of natural relationship that China has anyway. So I think if you go with that approach, I think it's going to be tremendously helpful in how you deal with the, with the Asian bias. It's actually the only approach right now. He's absolutely 100% right. Um, let me, you touched on Dallas, which triggered a thought, because I have family who lives in Dallas. Dallas has a thriving Chinese community, thriving. I learned this from visiting family. I wasn't on a search for this. Because we went into a shopping center one day, and it was, it was all Asian in the middle of Dallas. I mean, Dallas is probably the, the, the cradle of, the, of, of Republicans in the United States. And somewhere in all of this is, a, is this Chinese community. And I asked my brother, how the hell did this happen? Oh, you didn't hear? We got direct flights from China a couple years ago. That's it. And I didn't hear. But we know that direct flights are coming here, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. The direct flights turned out to be a major game changer in Dallas, they never sold Chinese before until they had a nonstop flight. Can't blame the Chinese. It's, I, you've been there. I've never been to China. Mm -hmm. But it's a long, long flight if it's direct. But you can't get from Miami direct. You always got to stop in Chicago, Dallas, LA, San Francisco. Imagine a nonstop flight, 787s, landing either in Miami International or Fort Lauderdale. That's an absolute game changer. And that's got to be a part of your big picture Miami story. Jesse has his reports that he puts out. ISG has this annual report we put out called the Miami Report, which is coming out hopefully in two weeks, um, hopefully sooner. And it talks about the underpinnings of what shapes the Miami economy, not just condos. It talks about the retail business. It talks about why millennials are descending in downtown Miami in numbers that were completely unexpected and has turned Miami into the third or fourth fastest growing tech center in the United States. Jesse ta talked about banking on Brickell Avenue. These are all how you, little factors, metrics, if you will, that doesn't sell Miami today, but it just but it paints a picture of where Miami's going. This is one of the most incredibly developable cities in the United States right now, and it's become fascinating on so many levels. I had an Asian guy come back a couple weeks ago. We had a show in San Francisco. There's a lot of big Asian community in San Francisco. I said, so Donnie, how did it go? So they went great. You know, Miami's a new city, so you know we're always selling Miami, we're always selling Miami. But what has, what what was interesting is how the new architecture from the new high-rise buildings being built in downtown Miami, Brickell Avenue, Miami Beach, 
has caught the attention of cities around the world. This is actually becoming an interesting model of a city. And I've had this confirmed by a few other people who've traveled around the world. Amongst other things, they talk about our stunning architecture. The developers in this town, they've got, they've got nerve. They're building some of the most extraordinary buildings in my, it, that Miami's ever seen, that Miami Beach has ever seen. And it turns out it's caught the attention of a lot of people around the world as well. I share this with you because I think it should be a part of your Miami story. Because this is like Oz. This is the sec, you know, my, Florida is the second fastest growing state in the United States. Texas grew last year by a rate of around 1,300 people a day. Florida was number two. We grew at 1,000 people a day. The law, a, a day. And Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach are 30% of that number. And I'm saying that because that's 30, we're 30% of the po population of Florida. So I'm just using reasonable statistics. If we're 30% of the population, my guess is 300 of those 1,000 people a day are coming to South Florida. And they're driving every aspect of the economy, every one. More luxury cars were sold in Miami last year than any other city in the country. Why is that? Because we have a lot of people moving here, and also because Jesse touched on South America. If you've ever, and the Brazilian, the, the Brazilian contingent knows this very well. It's dangerous to drive a real nice car in South America, anywhere in South America. You're inviting problems in your life. When they come up here and buy property, they get to enjoy the success of, their, of, their, of the fruits of their labor. So it adds to <laughs> the car industry. So you have these second home buyers from South America, you've got people moving here every day. These are all part of economic indicators, just a part of them, that you need to present to the Chinese. Because this is probably, of all the cities that's gonna, that has a remarkable future, for the next 10 years from a real estate perspective, you're in it. It's also, Miami. Also, if, if you're coming from Asia, what I've found with a lot <coughs> of our high net worth investors is that I can go to New York and I can spend, you know, a billion dollars and I sort of doesn't create a ripple. I can come to Miami and spend a hundred million dollars and be a major player. Mm -hmm. And I think for them to be able to penetrate the U.S. market here with tremendous influence, that's also very attractive to them. So I think the takeaway from what Craig and I were just saying is the importance of really understanding these economic drivers. You know, he speaks about the, the population growth here. That's created like a 3.6% positive job rate in, in the state when the national average is like one point something, 1 1.9. So we're, oh, we're nearly double that. So these economic drivers matter to the Chinese buyer. They're also very, very granular. They will ask you the most obtuse questions, obscure, out of nowhere questions but you have to be ready for that. Um, one of my bigger concerns here in Miami as a group of realtors and, and real estate sort of experts across the platform is that there's a very fractured approach to China. I think everyone is trying to get there first. And I think it's, a, you know, I, I have to give credit to Teresa and the association that is trying to create sort of the, the sharp edge of the spear, if you will, that together we'll get there faster, quicker, and more efficiently. So thank you for your efforts in that. Our and pleasure. also agreed, working agreed, with agreed. Uh, ARIA, which is the Asian Real Estate Association of America. Um, it was kind of interesting. I first joined ARIA three years ago, I think. I was on a flight to Argentina, and I ran into somebody on the gangway. I see, see I'm going to Argentina four days for the expo, and then when I get back, I'm going to Vegas. What are you doing in Vegas? I'm going to the ARIA convention. What's ARIA? Asian mm -hmm. Real Estate Association of America. I said, well, that's interesting. I'll go with you. I went to ARIA, understood what they stood for, and it is an association uh, focused on home ownership for the Asian community. And I saw how they operated, and I saw what they did, and I know that Teresa now has an alliance with them as an association. Yes. Um, and there are 17,000 strong members focusing on the Asian real estate. And it's not just realtors. It's mortgage providers, it's developers, it's anybody providing service to the Asian real estate community. So I joined ARIA. We've been working with ARIA the last couple of years. I'm the president-elect. Next year, I'll be the president of the Miami chapter. I just got back from Vegas two, three days ago, where we received a reward for the fastest growing chapter in the country. And it's kind of interesting. On our board of directors, there's an Australian, there's a Venezuelan, there's an Argentinian, there's, a, there's, there's nobody Asian. But <laughs> we actually do have about five Asians. And to Craig's point earlier, um, we also are actively hiring Mandarin-speaking agents. We have about eight um, Mandarin-speaking agents right now. But the ARI Association is one way for us to collectively get together. They've been on trade missions. Teresa's been on trade missions with them. 
And so I think that's the focus for us here, is not to try to, try to do it alone. Let's band together, let's tell the story of our city, where there's a lot of resources that we collectively have. The Asia report um, that uh, Teresa has, it's on, the, it's on the website, right? Yes. Um, it's from the Asia Society, the impact of Asian investment in the US. Fascinating article, fascinating report, very pointed as I started my conversation. Look into that before you go to Asia, because that will give you a, a, an understanding uh, of really what that market looks like and how it's getting to us. And the last thought I want to leave on this part of the conversation is that don't wait for the flights. If we wait for the flights, mm -hmm. it'll be too late. Yeah. You know, this is called about being Asia ready. And what does Asia ready mean, to Teresa's point? It means understanding cultures. It means having patience. It means understanding what their needs are. It, it means preparing your teams. It means preparing your, you know, we have our brochures in, in Chinese. We have agents who speak both Cantonese and Mandarin. Uh, so it's being ready for that because they're already here. The buyers are here. I think this is the sort of the, the sun is setting on the pre-Asia era. And I'm looking forward to the next 10 years because I think they'll be a significant part of Miami's history. What a great wrap-up statement. That's, Anything else? Yeah, let me just, I want to amplify one point, a couple points that Jesse made about not waiting for the planes. Listen, <clears throat> while the cultures are different, South America is different from the U.S., God knows China's different from everything. In the hearts and the bellies of every investor is this. Nobody wants to be early, or too early. They want to be early. They want to get here. Most of these Chinese, when you talk about the planes, nonstop flights, they know what that means. You don't have to elaborate on it. What really, in my opinion, what kind of started a lot of this Chinese chatter, and I think you need to know it too, is the expansion of the Panama Canal. That finally opened up this past summer. Jesse's right. The only two ports on the eastern seaboard of the United States that can accommodate these gigantic Panamax ships, which are three times the size of any cargo ship you've ever seen, is Miami or New York City. So that means a lot of these ships that are coming from California that used to land in either San Diego, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, they're coming through the Panama Canal now, and they're landing in Miami. Does it have an, another economic benefit to Miami? Of course, but that's not my point. The Chinese now are hearing about Miami because it's become a world trading hub, not the world trading hub, but a member of the world trading hub with these Chinese tankers. So a lot of that groundwork was laid right at your feet because of the expansion of the Panama Canal. They were hearing about Miami. They're hearing about it from a few. This is a country of 1.5 billion people. Jesse was telling me outside about the cities he was passing in the train that are larger than Miami every hour on the hour. Beijing must be just immense, but it's a big place. They're hearing about Miami. They're hearing about it. They want to hear about it from an investment perspective. And he's so right. The next two years before the flights come here, that's your opportunity to get the early investor that doesn't want to be too early, but they want to be early to take advantage of Miami in the present state that it's in. Did you have something else as a closing statement? No, I just wanted, you know, we haven't gotten into a lot of granular facts and figures because I think the Asia Society report does that. And these panels can also be extremely boring and, and sure. sort of when you listen to not, nothing but numbers. So I would encourage you to look at that. We actually um, were doing an event on Wednesday night where we're deciphering the, a, the, the Asia Society report. Um, and that'll be in downtown Miami from 5 to 7. If you're interested in doing that, there's also a chance to join ARIA as an opportunity. But we haven't specifically gotten into that granular detail because I think, you know, we wanted to share with you some of these real life scenarios. And so hopefully that's been, that's it's been helpful. It's been perfect. Let's hear it for both Craig and Jesse. Thank you guys.